Okay, pleasant good morning, everyone. And today we'll be looking at the skeletal system, bones and joints. In particular, where the skeletal system is concerned, we'll be looking at the axial and appendicular skeletons, right? In terms of the arrangement as it relates to the human skeleton itself. So let's see if we can begin where those things are concerned. Okay. All right, so the skeletal system. Is the skeletal system important? Okay, that was a facetious yes, question. It surely is. Notwithstanding, what, what is the major function of the skeletal system? Major function one. For movement. For movement. For movement, right. Uh, and which other two organ systems, all right? I've seen somebody raising their hand there. Yeah, who's that one, Keisha? Or I don't know if you answered already, Keisha. No, sir. I um, actually just wanted to mess to tell you that I came to class late because I messaged you having an interview. I just wanted to tell you that I was present. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Keisha. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank great you. Know you made it. You're welcome. Thanks for letting me know as well. All right. So skeletal system movement and it it in terms of interaction with two other organ systems which two other organ system does the skeletal system interact with the muscle, muscle system and the liver system yeah the muscle the muscle very good um both the muscle system and the nervous, nervous system, system. So that triad brings about movement. Now we are all familiar with the skeletal system in terms of its function. So it brings about movement and it supports us, right? Without it, yeah, that would be rather tricky. We'd be like a, a bowler glob on the ground, right? But it also stores a particular element within its structure, the skeleton itself. What, what um, element is associated with you know, um, the skeleton in terms of a storage, which element is stored within the structure of the skeleton itself. And if you are here, the abbreviation is CA, C-A. Calcium, sir. Calcium. And what do we need calcium for? In particular, we use calcium. If you were to throw back your mind to SNF1, and it is one of the organ systems which we spoke about just now, calcium is needed for MC. Muscle contraction. Excellent. Well done. Yeah, muscle contraction, right? So that is one of the important rules of the skeletal system. It's a repository for calcium. So not only does it support the body and enables movement through interaction with the nervous, uh, with both the nervous and muscular systems, but it's also a repository for calcium, which is critical for muscle contraction. All right. So when we look at bones and bone tissue in particular, when we look at an infant, we'll notice that the infants, you know, they have unfused bones, right? And here you have the fontanelles, the mandible, and so on. Why does an infant have unfused bones? One word, it begins with G. It has six letters. So it doesn't make sense. I teach, you all know everything. Excellent. Yeah, for growth, right? Because what would have happened if the skull didn't have these spaces here? What would happen as the brain grew? What would happen? Mm -hmm. Trinell, I'm not hearing you too clear. What would happen to the brain? If my imagine it doesn't have these spaces, right? So it can't. What would happen if the brain is growing and you have a fixed area in which it is, you know, where it is um, residing? What do you think would happen to the brain? So I'm guessing that um, there will be pressure on the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pressure on the brain. 
right? And that could cause a lot of issues, you know, in terms of um, the brain itself. Since it's pushing up, those pressures could cause rupture of the tissue and all different sorts of things. You will see in your professional career, when people come in with head injuries, what do they sometimes do? Let's say from a car crash or from some other trauma to the head, sometimes they actually have to crack the skull because it's a normal reaction in terms of inflammation and the brain swells. So they actually have to crack the skull so that the brain will swell out. And then of course, they, they usually put the person, they induce them into a coma, right? And then the brain after a couple of days will, after the inflammation gone down, it would return to its normal size. And then of course, well, left its own devices, the, um, the cracks could actually heal, right? They, they once again rejoin through the action of the osteoblast and osteoclast. But that is very important in terms of having those spaces where the head is concerned. And what's another, when you think about it, another thing um, that is important where the fontanelles are concerned in terms of delivery. Why, why is it important that you do have these fontanelles in terms of vaginal okay. delivery? Yeah. It makes the head flexible to come through the passage. Yeah. So, you know, some babies have big heads. If these bones were fixed, what are we talking about? Vaginal tearing. You can just imagine, oh, you know, pain, thrills, and excitement where that, is, where that is concerned. So that is really important in terms of having these fontanelles or spaces. So literally, the skull um, is deformed as it comes through the vaginal passage. But of course, it... You know, it does pop back into place, you know, after delivery, right? But that is just the inshore. And you don't have tearing occurring, you know, and that's very important. Um, sometimes, we, do they still use forceps? I'm not an obstetrician. And I haven't revisited that topic. Do they use forceps? Or maybe they've changed the structure of the forceps. But you just have to be very careful. I remember my nephew, um, when he was born, they used forceps. And actually, when after for about the better part a couple of weeks after he was born, he had the imprint of the forceps on the side of his head. You know, so you always have to be careful. I'm not sure if they still use them, or maybe they changed the design, right? But he had the imprint on the side of his head, but it, it did go away after a couple of weeks. So you have to keep that in mind, you know, if the doctor says yes, you know, giving you that option in terms of where forceps are concerned. The mandible or jaw, unfused bones, the coccyx, this is unfused bones as well because the vertebral column is still growing. And of course, the sacrum, which precedes the coccyx itself, is very important because the spine is still growing within the vertebral column. That vertebral column offering protection to the developing spine. And even though we don't think about it, all here is really the brain, you know. Is the brain separated from the spine? No. No, no sir. No. What would happen if you had separation? You need Movement in the spine. What would happen if you had a separation between the two? There's one word. It begins with P. It gets some form of? Paralysis. Yeah. Paralysis. Yeah, you get paralysis, right? So, so even though, and this is a funny thing, whenever they show you the brain, you know, they, just, they usually show them separate, the brain or the, or the spinal cord, usually the spinal cord is encased in the vertebra, right? But in general, it, not in general, it always, it is an attachment. So it looks like a tail. Think about it, like we have a brain with a tail and within, you know, within this vertebral column, the spinal cord goes all the way down. And it's very important, it is growing um, as the baby grows. So these bones are infused for that reason. All right, so the type of bones, here we're looking at different bones, short bones and long bones. Why do they call a long bone a long bone and a short bone a short bone? Anybody? A short bone, short and a long bone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some things, is, some things are not difficult in life. Yeah, long bones are long and short bones are short. So here, for instance, we're looking at the hand itself. These bones are pretty small. Those are the short bones. And here is the long bone in your body itself. And I call them long because it is long. Right? What is, in terms of, um, yeah, this is, I want to guess it. Or is looking at the hand itself, another bone, but you also have the long bones, you know, in the leg itself. 
Um, those are very important. And the FEMA in particular, likes probably, it takes the most strain in the body and is, it is the hardest bone in the body itself. So let's say if you were fighting, you know, looking to fight someone, I don't condone, I don't condone violence of any type, but let's say you're going to fight somebody and when you look wrong, you only see in one set of skeleton, well, the best bone to grab is the femur because that is the hardest bone. It takes the most pressure in the body. So therefore it's the strongest bone in the body itself, the femur. All right, and here we have irregular bone. We have compact bone tissue shown here in the mandible, right? Mandible and the maxilla. The upper jaw is known as the maxilla, the lower one is mandible. How do we tell the difference between the two in terms of naming? Well, I remember one student once told me that, you know, the lower jaw, when you think about a man, men have beards, yeah? So if you're very, because it's easy to mix up mandible and maxilla. So whenever you think of a lower jaw, jawbone, think about a beard. So, you know, then this is the mandible. And the other one, the upper jaw, will be the maxilla. And then the flat bones, it does, contain, it does contain compact bone tissue and spongy bone in the middle. Right? So the outside, we'd have the compact and the inner part is the spongy bone. And a, a, a nice example of compact and spongy bone, what we could relate to. Anybody here like nyum, nyum, KFC Royal Castle? Nyum, nyum, nyum. Nobody here like KFC Royal Castle? What are you saying? You have a set of vegetarian celery then? Celery and carrot? No? Royal Castle, sir. Okay, Royal Castle, right. So, you know, in particular, when you, I don't know if anybody here likes to chew chicken bones, right? When you're cracking the bone, right? When you bite, crack, you have the crunchy part on the outside. Well, actually, that is compact bone tissue. And you realize the inside, notwithstanding the marrow, but before you reach the marrow, it's soft. And that is because it's spongy bones. So, that's a nice way to remember it. You know, if again, Confuse us. Which one is, you know, does the compact bone come inside or outside? Just think about biting, you know, a chicken leg bone, you know, if you're chewing it up. Yeah, it's had a crack the outside, you know, and that's because it's compact bone on the outside and the spongy bone is on the inside. And of course, you do have the bone marrow, which contains the hematopoietic stem cells. And those stem cells are the one that make what? The bone marrow is very important for making. RBC, I mean, not talking about Republic Bank or Royal Bank of Canada. Red blood cells. Red blood cells. Always remember that. Anytime you hear the word hematopoietic stem cells or bone marrow, what should come to mind is making red blood cells. You look more at that in SNF2. All right. And so you look at that next semester. Let's have a look at the structure of a long bone. The structure of the long bone has the tip, the top part, or the epiphysis. The metaphysis, which comes immediately below the epiphysis, and then the diaphysis or the shaft. So the major part of the bone is that shaft is the diaphysis, and the ends are known as the epiphysis. And between the ends and the middle, well, of course, you have the metaphysis. Interestingly enough, for those who have broken bones, they realize they get pain. And the reason why is because not only do you have blood vessels crisscrossing the bone, but you also have nerves present in the bone itself. Right, so this is us showing you the structure. And again, we'd have the compact bone towards the end, shown here on the outer area. And on the inner area, you have that spongy bone. Why do they call spongy bone spongy bone? Because of the structure of it, it's uh, like a mesh. Yeah, it's it, looks like a, it looks like a sponge. Very good, Penny. You know, so, you know, the thing is wash up words with some of us, unless you're a diver or live near the sea, you know, they, they're actually um, sponges, you know, these creatures that live in the sea called sponges. And, but now they use it, they make artificial sponges as it will, right? But it is spongy in terms of having those spaces. And that's why they call it spongy bone because it looks like a sponge. So some things in life are not difficult. Here in the diaphysis, you notice the spongy bone has more space located in it. As, as opposed to in the epiphysis, so in the diaphysis, there are more spaces as when compared to the ends of the epiphysis. All right, the bone cells, very important. Osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. The osteoblasts build bone. So for instance, if you have, if you break a bone, 
right? And there's a fracture, of course, you have the breakdown which occurs of the bone itself, that is done um, by the osteoclast. But in terms of building back the bone, of laying down the bone, that's the job of these cells, the osteoblasts. And of course, the osteocytes, these are the ones that nourish them. So the, very important when you're thinking about these two, the osteobats build and the osteoclasts break it down. And when you do break down the bone, you release calcium. And we'd look at that in just a second to see, to see why that is important in terms of the release of calcium in the body at certain times. But do remember, blasts and classes are the two major ones. And how do we remember which one builds, blue, builds bone? Well, osteoblasts have the B. Or another way, or another student told me this one time, when you think about like the Big Bang Theory, you know, and the creation of the world, right? It was this big explosion. So, you know, that was how the world started or it was built. So that is one way to think about it. Anybody can think of any other way in terms of how we remember osteoblast build and osteoclast cut or cleave or breakdown. Anybody can think about it another way? Are those two cool? If you think those two cool, raise up your hand. No, so I think those those explanations still mm -hmm. relevant. Okay, good. I've seen people I raising a hand. Excellent. So they're raising a hand, Trinalital and others. Priscilla and so on. So I guess we'll use those. Great. Let's go. So this is us showing the microscopic structure of a long bone in terms of the structure itself. You look more at this in the when you look, when you're doing your lab. Now let's talk about this calcium homeostasis or the maintenance. What does the word homeostasis mean again? Coming from the Greek word homo, homo meaning st same and stasis state. So maintenance of a constant internal environment that is critical. And in terms of calcium homeostasis, one, we have the absorption from food itself is absorbed into the blood. And then the osteoblasts, the bone synthesis, they build it up into the bone itself. When calcium, when, low, when calcium levels are low, the osteoclasts, they are very important in terms of returning that calcium into the bloodstream itself. This is just showing you a parathyroid hormone. So the, this is very, this hormone is very important in terms of regulating blood calcium levels. Let's see how that is done. So we're, when you're looking at this diagram, it's important always to start where it says start. So when the blood calcium levels are higher than normal, right? So you have a high blood calcium levels. This causes the inhibition of the thyroid gland. So the, the parathyroid gland, which reside within the thyroid gland, you have a reduced parathyroid hormone output. And the reduced output, this causes the blood calcium levels to drop. And, you know, initially you had an increase when you have reduced parathyroid hormone and the concentration drops. This will eventually decrease until you have normal blood calcium levels again. If when you're starting, it's lower than normal, it's decreased, right? You have a low blood calcium level or concentration. This will then cause the simulation, stimulation, sorry, of the PTH or the parathyroid hormone to be uh, secreted. And this parathyroid hormone, it causes the calcium concentration to increase. And when the calcium concentration, of course, this is due to the activation of the osteoclast, and then you have a return to normal, and right? the concentration um, will return to normal, and then the normal blood calcium levels are attained. So this is just showing you in terms of homeostasis, right? how it is then that you do have this mechanism involving the uh, parathyroid hormone secretion from the thyroid gland by the parathyroid glands itself, OK? So we looked at the cells involved with calcium regulation, osteoblast, osteoclast, supporting sites. And we also looked then at the mechanism involved, homeostatic mechanism involving the thyroid and the parathyroid hormone secretion from the thyroid gland. The next thing you want to look at is the different types of joints. Let's have a look at these now. So in the skull itself, you have these special joints in terms of 
their construction, you have fibrous connective tissue, which are formed between the skull bones. And it's a rather firm joint. These are very important fibrous joints. And it doesn't really move about a lot, as we could imagine. When you think about your skull, for those of us who play football, or for those of us who had make a little um, mistake, sometimes you step on your forehead and you hit your head, yeah, you'll just feel a little woozy, but then you know you could go about your business, right? So very importantly, when we look at the fibrous joints, and more so the cell arthrosis, which occur within the skull itself, these allow no movement of the within the joints. They're very, very firm. So what does that mean? Well, that offers protection to the brain if you do happen to have some type of trauma, either when falling or get some type of blunt force applied to the skull itself. We also have cartilaginous joints, which are present in the vertebral columns. So this just shows the vertebra and the joint that is present there. This is very important in terms of cushioning. I so uh, I think we mentioned it last day. I don't know. Did we mention it last day in terms of primary school jumping down the steps? We mentioned that last day. Yes. No. Yes, Brent. Go ahead. Um. So. When, when people get older and like mm -hmm. it's not a rubber, mm -hmm. is that because of like arthritis? It could be. Sometimes they have rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually something very specific to the joints and it does cause compression of the joints. But in general, as you get older, these cartilaginous joints, just by nature, they start to weaken and compress. We have to look at it from the perspective. Remember, they're getting pressure. They're looking at somebody, let's say, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. That's like 60 years of pressure they're getting. So just by nature, these cartilaginous joints, they compress as you get older. Some persons, it affects it. They are affected more than others. And when they do, some persons, they do get a joint pain associated with arthritis, yes. So, you know, that's why you would see some persons, you know, bent, and some persons get uh, problems to walk because they get pain, physical pain. Another thing, of course, because of the fact that you do get natural compression in this uh, cartilage, older persons actually get shorter. <laughs> you get shorter once you pass a certain age. Because of the fact you have compression, you're getting compressions of this cartilage. So they actually do get shorter physically as they get older. Yeah. But yes, it is the, the pain that is comes about as a reason. Some people get it worse depending on what happens to the cartilage. You could have the car, bone on bone, and which is really the worst type of pain, and that is associated with arthritis. As I mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very specific one, that one has a genetic component attached to it. And with rheumatoid arthritis, particularly when you look at the fingers, persons have difficulty stretching out their fingers. So when you see persons who have rheumatoid arthritis in the hands, the joints themselves are swollen and you'll see person, you know, they can't keep the fingers straight. They're usually curved. And of course it is painful. It is quite painful. Rheumatoid arthritis could occur in persons from your teenage years right up. So it's, it doesn't have a respect of age where that is concerned in terms of rheumatoid arthritis. Anybody here know somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis in the hands, usually in particular in the hands, where the joints swell out? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or oh, you have it, yeah? Yes. Is there any particular times where um, you get the pain more than others? Let's say with a change in weather. Yes, so like some days when like today Halloween for mm -hmm. where, where I live, mm -hmm. it come according to my uncle, I get up like a crab because mm -hmm. you're swollen and you know you're bent over and you have to like pour out until mm -hmm. you could move your joint. Some days you could hold a cup properly and some mm -hmm. days you can't even grip the cup. Mm. Is there anything that relieves your pain or, or allows more flexibility? Anything you could take particular? I'm, I'm guessing, do, or do they prescribe steroids for you when I was concerned? Well, my doctor did not want to prescribe steroids for Smart me. Move. So Smart for move. me, mm -hmm. I just use a heating pad mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. my hands or knees or whatever joints mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and the heat helps the pain. 
Excellent. Okay, that is good to know. So then we got a first hand um, account of it, and thanks for sharing. That's that's very nice to know that Alice then said. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to some other joints. We're looking at the synovial joint, which has synovial fluid. Remember, this is probably the most familiar of the lot, and it does allow free movement to occur in these synovial joints. The other thing, of course, you do have gases which do accumulate in the synovial joints, and when you release these gases, right, you get this sound, a popping noise, and I, so I think some of us might be familiar with it when we crack our knuckles, particularly in when we in primary school. Remember some people always like to crack, crack, crack your knuckles. That's the release of gases that build up in the synovial fluid. All right, so in more detail, this just speaks to the joints. The immovable, immovable, sorry, slightly and freely movable, movable diathrosis, Right, so this is telling you the joint, the material connections, and this just shows the examples of them. Please take note of this. You might see this again uh, in the SNF2 assessment, right? In terms of the immovable, slightly movable, and freely movable found in the skull, your vertebral column, and of course, in your synovial joints. So this is just showing the synovial joint. And again, here we have very important uh, it's showing the cartilage between the joints because without them, you'd have bone and bone pain, which my understanding is is the 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 most uh, painful thing you could experience bone and bone pain. Right, so it's very important that you have that protection which the cartilage gives at the end of the bone. Here you have an accessory ligament, which uh, allows support to the joint and prevents it from actually going out of position. There's a certain amount of flexibility you do have, but this acts like a, uh, like a rubber band, keeps it from going too far out in terms of keeping the integrity of the joint. Here you have uh, periosteum, right? Peri, again, the word itself, Peri around an osteo, osteo, osteum, referring to the bone. So this is the protective sheath, which is found around bone matrix. All right, so the classifications of the synovial joints, specifically you have the pivot gliding, um, condyloid, the bowl and socket, hinge joint and the saddle joint and these are their locations and they are related to the movements which you have the pivot joint right which is found at the elbow uh, the gliding joint condyloid joint relating to the hand ball and socket for those of us who play cricket very important for bowling right it allows that to that movement, that virtual 360 movement, you know, at the level of the shoulder. Then, of course, at the elbow, you do have the hinge joint. And then lastly, the saddle joint, which is unique to the thumb. For those of us, for insurance purposes, out of all the fingers, the thumb is the most expensive one in terms of loss of limb. So when you're looking at life insurance, you know, when you do have loss of limb or lo loss of parts of limb, when you're looking at the hand, they pay out the most if you lose a thumb as compared to the other fingers. And the reason being, if you were to look at the thumb, the thumb has the most movement and it allows us in particular to grasp things very well. It's, a, it's an adjustable joint. So the thumb is the most expensive of the insured joints. And the reason why, because of that, the scope of the movement, which is brought about by that saddle joint. All right, this has goes this has goes over and shows those other joints, the gliding, the hinge, which we mentioned, pivot joint uh, allows rotation around the length of the bone, right? So this is that pivot joint associated with the neck in terms of that left-right motion. Condyloid saddle, ball and socket, which we outlined just now, and do take note of their locations. Now Look at the type of joints, synovial. Now let's look at the movements associated with them. Flexion and extension. Flexion, you're bringing it in. Extension is playing it out. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsi, when you're bringing your foot into a perpendicular, making a 90 degree angle, as opposed to plantar flexion, when you have a 180 degree angle uh, with your tibia. All right, so notice when it's flat out, this is plantar flexion and dorsiflexion is when it forms this 90 degree angle. Abduction, 
right? An adduction, adduction is bringing it in, abduction is taking it away, inversion and eversion, and again, relating to bringing it in and taking it out, these two movement. Circumduction is bring, moving it in a circular motion, right? So bringing it round and round. Uh -huh. As subscribing is, is like if you're drawing a circle, then no, drawing a circle in the air, and the circumduction and rotation, of course, is moving it above your about your neck. Pronation and sup, supination, prone and supine position. Pronation is when your palm is facing downwards. Supination is when your palm is facing upward. Prone and supine positions, and then. This is the movements. You have flexion and extension, right? So flexion, and when you have extension, it goes through. And then, of course, you have hyperextension. It is very important. Again, when you're playing cricket, right, that last step before that comes down on the bowl increase, right, that's a hyperextension you have there. Abduction and adduction. Ad is when it comes towards the body, and ab is when it goes away. And circumduction is you're making a circle or prescribing a circle with your foot itself. Now, sometimes with these two, abduction and adduction, it's very easy to mix them up. Could somebody think of a way where we could, how we could think of adduction is bringing the leg towards the body and abduction is away from? Could you think of a way which you could remember it? Because it's very easy to get confused, yeah? Mm -hmm. Add, add to the body and add to the body. So say that one more time. Yeah. Add. Adduction is to add to the body and abduction is to take away. Oh, so you're adding, right? So again, like 11, and then you take away one, and so the other one will be ab, right? But add is really, yeah, you're getting one, one next to the other. I like that one. Anything, anybody else? All right, so I guess that's the best one then. <laughs> well done. If we was in class, I would have had some type of treat to throw away candy or something. You know, I used to do in my class, have candy and cupcake for breakfast, for birthdays. Right? And on a good day, I used to bring candy and, and keep around. I hear what you're saying. Sir, sir, too much candy, not good for you. Granted, everything in moderation. Let's look at these special movements. Protraction, movement of the jaw away from the body line and retraction is pulling it in. All right, so you're looking at the jaw, the mandible, you're moving it out, and you're bringing it back in, you have retraction. Depression and elevation, opening and closing, so you're moving it up and down, elevating the mandible, and this one you're pushing it down. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. For those of us, I don't know, do we have anybody who dives um, in terms of, well, off of a diving board, you know, when you, you have to point your toes, or if you're a ballerina, ballerinas go up and you know on the tips of the toes that's plantar flexion but for those who play football when you're hitting you know a volley you, know, you have to point your toes downward and you have to hit across as i say hit across the laces so the ball coming and you run your laces through the ball right so that'll be plantar flexion those are examples there inversion and eversion inversion that motion eversion is when you're taking it away so so very important in terms of those two in and out I remember we used to do this right now we used to train for football in terms of, and this really strengthens the um it strengthens the ankle prevents ankle injuries in terms of this motion we used to do that during the warm-ups yeah in and out and you have pronation pronation is the palm facing downward and supination or the supine position that's when the palms are facing upwards 
we look at the joints, we mentioned the cells associated with them. Let's see how it all comes together in terms of the grouping of the skeleton. So when you're looking at the skeleton groups, we have the axial and the appendicular skeletons. So what is the axial and the appendicular skeletons? What do they consist of? Looking at these diagrams, could somebody tell me what does the, in general, you don't have to get into specificity, what does the axial skeleton consist of? The skull and the vertebral column. The skull, the vertebral column. Anything else? Or is Correct, the rib cage. Right, the ribs. Uh, the ribs, as some people like to say, ribs or ribs, right? Quite right. So the skull, the ribs, and by extension, of course, the clavicle, right? Skull, vertebral columns, and the ribs. That forms the axial. And the appendicular skeleton consists of what? The girdles. You have the pectoral and the pelvic girdles and then the attachments to them, the legs and the arms. All right, so that's the division of the skeleton. And the axial is more to the center or the axis. All right, so you have the central axis and running down the center. Yeah, that's why they call it the axial skeleton. So it consists of the skull, vertebral column and the ribs. That's around down the center. And then of course, coming off of the central axial skeleton, you have the girdles, the pectoral, and the cervical, cervical girdle, yeah. And these two girdle, the pelvic girdle, sorry. And coming off of them, you have the legs, lower limb, uh, tibia and fibula, and of course your feet down here. All right, so that's the two skeleton groups, the axial and the appendicular. Let's have a look at the axial. We're looking now at the skull. Is just color coded, so you'll be able to tell the difference in terms of the parts. So we have the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone. All right, this bone here uh, this is the ethmoid bone, the zygomatic. What's another name for your zygomatic? Brent, go ahead. Um, no, sir, I just had a question about the okay, skeleton. Go okay, go ahead. This, go ahead, Brent. Mm -hmm. Skeleton. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, we both are, as male and female, we have like about the same um, same type of skeleton. Well, same same thing basically. So, how um, does people, well, those who are um, observing, you know, those people in, um, I forget what it's called, how do they be able to differentiate what type of, um, whether it's a male or a female like skeleton? Well, like say like a de decompose, right? Oh, forensic, yeah, 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 yeah. How, how do they um able to identify which one is um male and female? Because Anyb when they decompose, it's like the tissue is gone. Like the same thing. Yeah. Anybody? How, how are you? Based on the mm -hmm. based on the hip. Yeah. The size of the hip. The yeah. Females tend to have wider hips. Yeah. So in fact, we we coming to that. That's a very good question you asked there. And um, Brent, it has to do with the with the flaring of the hips. And in terms of female, females tend to have broader hips. And the reason for that is, of course, has to do with childbearing. Um, in addition, that is, that is, those broad hips uh, actually comes uh, for footballers. I don't know how many female footballers, but FIFA has done a study and it, had, and it was shown that in terms of injury to ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament in the knee, females tend to have uh, much more ruptures of that ligament than males. And the reason why is because of the fact that the hips are flared. So because the hips are flared, when you're looking at the femur, you know, the femur uh, going down to the knee, it's a, it's a little bit of, a, of an interesting angle that it makes, right? And then you come down to the knee. So that angle, it makes it that much more easier for the rupture of the ACL, right? So, but to answer your question, yes, how could they tell if it's a male or female? They could do two things. One, anatomically, in terms of the structure of the hips, Above two, of course, they could also do DNA analysis of the tissue. You might say, okay, so while well, the tissue is decomposed, you might get a good DNA sample. Based on the skull, there's one area in the skull that's a very good repository of DNA. The teeth. What you're saying? Yes, yeah, very good, your teeth. Right, you know the pulp in your teeth? 
that actually is encased, you know, in enamel. And enamel is the hardest known substance in the human body. It's very hard, which is why, as you well know, you know, you could bite. Um, bones and so on, chew them up and what have you not. So what they could do, once they have a head, they could drill the tooth and the pulp, from the pulp, they extract those cells and they could extract the DNA. And they could tell from the DNA if it's male or female. Right? If you remember, uh, we do have 22 autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. So that's able to tell them. So that's sometimes what they do as well. Because I hear what they, because there are some situations where some persons do not have, females don't have, you know, flared hips and is not necessarily straightforward just to tell by looking at the skeleton itself. So that's another thing they could do. They could drill the teeth and extract the pulp and do a DNA analysis of the pulp tissue itself to find out if it's male or female. Which is why sometimes I hear what you're saying. Uh, and again, I don't condone violence. But you know, sometimes, you know, those, I think, well, cartels and so on. But when they do kill people, they'll take off their head, right? They cut off their heads, or sometimes they'll cut off their hands and their feet. Well, for ID purposes, of course, they'll cut off their hands and feet because then you can't get a uh, toe print or a fingerprint, right? Fingerprints is how you can identify somebody, toe print as well. Right, so they'll cut off their hands and their feet, and they would sometimes they do cut off the head as well because of the fact to negate that identification from the jaw as, as related to the DNA itself. Yeah, and not too pleasant, but it, it is a reality of life. I don't know if I answered your question, Brent. Yes, it does. Okay, great. All right, so we're looking at the bones, uh, the parietal. The one on the top of your head, frontal, and again, why they call the frontal bone the frontal bone because it's in front, temporal because it's in the temp, the temp, the temple area, and to the back you have the occipital. There's a green bone shown here, the occipital bone, right? And to the front, we we mentioned it, the zygomatic is also known as the cheekbone, right? So that's a cheekbone there, and then of course the mandible and the maxilla, which you mentioned before. The ethmoid and sphenoid bones, uh, these are the ones which is just superior to the temporal bone, right? You have the sphenoid bone, and uh, those are the major bones associated with the skull itself. It's a very important joint, the temporal, the temporomandibular joint from between the mandible and the temple, temple bone, hence the reason of the name itself. You have the hyoid bone, right? Hyoid bone is the only bone associated with the uh, tracheal region and this actually you do have an attachment from the cartilage and it keeps the trachea open this is the hyoid bone for those of us who in karate i don't know if anybody does karate or some martial arts yeah there's a weak point yeah if you smash this bone the person will start a <gasps> right because the you'll have a collapse of the trachea this holds the trachea up so if you happen to, you know, if you deliver a blow right below the chin and you actually crack this bone, they'll have a lot of difficulty in breathing. All right. So <laughs> I don't know if any, I didn't notice anybody here, but that's that is always a, a weak point when you're fighting. Right? That hyoid bone, you don't want to get it damaged. This is showing the inferior view. What, what do you think? So we're looking from, you know, we're looking up. Right, so which what the foramen magnum, what do you think? We're looking up into the skull, right? So this then here, this will be your maxilla we're looking at, right? So imagine here you know, from the base looking up. What do you think comes down the foramen magnum? What spinal structure? Cord. The spinal cord, very good, yeah. And foramen, right? Foramen are usually just holes. So here you have the foramen ovale shown here. And you'd also see when you're doing um, in SNF2, when you're looking at reproduction, you also have a foramen ovale in the heart, right? And uh, so it does, the foramen ovale, it allows the, mix, the mixing of the blood when in the fetal heart, but it does close up at birth. You don't want to have mixing then because the lungs are non-functional. You do have that, that mixing occurring. But the foramen magnum here, which means really a large hole, this is where the spinal cord comes out of the brain. And it attaches, of course, to your first vertebra. The first vertebra causes pivoting. Okay.
Halo? Oh, <laughs> I was talking without, without the noise on. Yeah, so the spinal cord comes down here in terms of the foramen ovale, and you have the axis vertebra, right? The axis vertebra, the atlas, sorry, the atlas is the first one, and then you have the axis vertebra. We'll see about those in a little while in terms of those two structures. So this is just looking at the skull from different uh, sections, the sagittal section, but again, it's color coded. If you notice these color codes for the different bones, the temporal, occipital, frontal, parietal, the code is constant, you know, throughout these views as shown here. All right. Now we come to a baby skull, fontanelle, as I mentioned, this fontanelle, uh, it's a soft spot. And it does allow for vaginal delivery. It also allows for the expansion of the skull itself. Some people will know what it was another name for this one in the center of a, of a baby's head. What is called it? Four letters. Begins with M. Mole. Yeah, the mole. mole. The mole of the head. And what, what the old people they say, what you could do to close the mole? What you is do? Coconut oil. Coconut oil, yeah? We rub it with coconut oil. Does it work? Probably it does. Hey, old people know a lot of things, right? So, do, of course, at your discretion, do let me dictate to you what to do, whether it's concerned in terms of children under your care. But yeah, the old say rub it with coconut oil is, is help close the fontanelle uh, faster in terms of this soft spot on the top of their head. Right? So here we have these cranial sutures. We have the sagittal suture. The this is sphenoid bone, of course, of course. And back here you have a lambdoid suture. Now, whenever they have another view, the reason why they call it the lambdoid, a lambda, the Greek letter lambda, it looks like an upside down Y. So you know you have it coming here, and then you have one here, and so just think about a Y, uh, but you have it upside down. So you have one here, you have left and right, and that is known as the, that is what a lambda looks like, lambda the Greek letter lambda. So they call this a lambdoid suture because it looks like the Greek letter lambda. Lambda, L-A-M-D-A. This is the temporal bone, right, shown here. And I reason this is, of course, is right over the temple. And the occipital is the one to the back. Oh, I like to remember the occipital bone. Anybody familiar with cows? What song does an ox make? Uh-huh. What sound does an ox make? Moo. Moo. I never thought about the ox sound. Huh? <laughs> I think so. I think our ox is, uh, is in the cow family. Um, they're very resistant. They're, one of the good things with oxes, as opposed to cows, um, they could go into muddy water. Because cows and them, they have a problem with moisture they're very susceptible cows in particular to open mouth disease you know they get this infection in their hooves but you do have with oxen and zebu um, they're able to go into like marsh you see them saying down in fact you know in the mud and so on and they don't have that problem right so but they're all in the ox they're all in the cow family so i'm guessing somebody could tell me different but as far as i know there's go moo just like a cow but yeah, when the I, sound. I hear it Wait, hold on. Pardon? the sound the sound Wait, yeah. i think it's go moo does it it's go moo you know i never really <laughs> <laughs> oh that you have a recording of it yes yeah it does sound like a moo it sounds just like a cow thanks very much <laughs> Right now, what that has to do with the occipital bone? Well, I remember ox, and one of the things I always remember with an ox whenever you see a cow is they swish in the tail. So you know, I think about this, you know, with a tail coming out here, you know, the spinal um, cord down here. So therefore, the bone that is, you know, posterior and inferior to the um, to these other bones, you know, one on the bottom. That's why I remember it's an occipital bone because I think about a cow tail you know, in relation to the spine. So that's why I remember this one as the occipital bone. 
This again is us showing the different bones, as we mentioned before, right? And again, they're color coded to let you know the mandible below, maxilla on top, and then you have the others, the vomer, the zygomatic, right? There's the cheekbone, lacrimal bone that's on the inside there, the temporal bone, and so on. All right, so the vertebral column itself, seven, twelve, five, five, four. Right, these are fused, the sacrum and the coccygeal, but composed of five and four. Uh, so seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral fused, and four coccygeal fused. Seven, twelve, five, five, four. The atlas vertebra, top one, the first one, and then you have the axis. Well, anybody know this story with the atlas vertebra? Why they call it atlas? There's a little story behind that one. Again, in Greek mythology, when you were naughty, the gods would do things to you. So there was this man um, who was naughty and his punishment was to hold up the world for the rest of his life, right? Sometimes you'd see it. Yeah. So that was his punishment. And so I don't know if sometimes you see, there's this image with somebody holding up like a globe over there, like on their back. Yeah, that, is, that guy's atlas, right? So hence the reason the first vertebra, because it holds up the head, is known as the atlas. And then of course, which allows free movement is the axis, the axis vertebra, which is C2. That's the, it allows the movement. What do you think these numbers on the side of C1, C2? What does C2 mean? Anybody? Second cervical. Thank you very much, Chanel. Yeah, the second. So these numbers, C3, C4, it refers to the specific vertebral vertebra. And similarly for the thoracic T78. Now, why is that important to have them? L1, L2. Why is it important? One word begins with L. Location. Excellent. Yeah. So anatomically, particularly when you're looking at surgeries or if you're looking at x-rays, you could, you could identify certain, org certain organs, certain structures, they have boundaries as related to these anatomical uh, signposts, you could call them in terms of the vertebra. So being looking at the vertebra, you could tell, you could look there and then to be able to identify certain organs and structures. So again, this is showing the infant showing the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Note with the infant, it's curved like this, but with the, uh, when you become an adult, you have this double curve that occurs in the vertebral column. All right, so the structure of the vertebra, if you will notice, you have a body, and then you have the spinous process. And of course, you have the transverse. So the spinous process, the transverse process, and this shows the lumbar vertebrae. Note the size of the body itself. The cervical vertebra, the body gets smaller. And the axis vertebra, well, it's even, it's virtually non-existent in terms of the body itself. So this body, it gives strength to the vertebra. So as you go lower down, right? So the lumbar would have the largest body because it is supporting more weight as you go down the vertebral column. That is important to note of that structure. This is just showing the sacrum and the coccyx. Again, as I mentioned, uh, four, seven, twelve, five, five, four. You have five of them fused, and then you have four coccygeal bones there fused, right? To form the sacrum. Within them, you do have the spinal cord, which actually still runs through them. And then, of course, you have the holes or the foramen through which the you have an attachment to different nerves in the body. We look at the vertebral column. We mentioned uh, appendicular and axial skeletons. Let's have a look at the thorax. Ribs. We have, what are the different types of ribs we have? We have three types. What are they? What are the three types of ribs or classification of ribs? We have the true ribs, which are ribs one to seven. We have the false ribs, which are eight to 12. And then we have the floating ribs. Right, very good, right? False ribs, 
we have ribs specifically, ribs 11, uh, 11 and 12, they're called floating. And why they're called floating? Because they're not specifically either through cartilage or directly linked to the sternum, right? So the sternum is the middle bone. The two ribs, they're attached directly, the false ribs, right? They're attached via uh, the cartilage to one structure here, but the floating ribs, they, they're not attached at all to the sternum. So that's why the reason why they call it that. We have the intercostal space, and within the intercostal space, you do have the intercostal muscles, which are not shown here because we're not looking at muscles. And these are very important. You would see that in SNF2 when we're speaking about respiration, you do have the muscles, the intercostals together with the diaphragm and the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which actually runs from the sternum um, to the clavicle. Very important for those three are the main ones associated with the um, with breathing. Here, they're just looking at sternal landmarks. So for instance, you could identify certain structures based on the, these bones, the bones associated with the clav clavicle. So this nipple, for instance, this runs just superior to the xiphoid process. So this is the xiphoid process here. That's the uh, pointy part of the tie. If you want to look at a clavicle like a tie, right? Right, pointy part just superior to that is the nipple. And posterior to that, you have the liver. So you could, in terms of making then incisions, right? What you, depending on what organ or what structure you want to access, that's how the surgeon could know where to make the incisions based on those landmarks. So you know then exteriorly, let's say for instance, you're looking at the nipple, you can make that incision and you know um, immediately below you would run into the sternum and then behind it or inferior to it you'd have the liver so that's how those anatomical landmarks are very important girdles so you have two girdles your pectoral and the pelvic girdle right so the pectoral girdle they allow very free movement to occur about that joint itself Right, so here we're looking at the, sh the shoulder girdle. Let's take note of the different bones which form the shoulder girdle, but they allow that free rotation. And the best example of it is when you see a, a cricketer bowling, right? You have that free 360 movement about that joint. Upper limb, the shoulder, you have the arm, the forearm and the hand. And in terms of those joints, elbow and the wrist joint. The humerus, in terms of the bones of the arm itself, the humerus, ulna, and radius, that's for the lower arm. The humerus, it has this deltoid tuberosity, or this bit of a groove, and then you have these anatomical neck and the head of the humerus itself. The elbow joint, we don't have to get into too much detail as it relates to the elbow joint, but just to appreciate the movement that occurs at the elbow joint itself. The shoulder joint, we mentioned this, uh, we already mentioned this. And again, in terms of the detail, just have to appreciate the 360 motion that occurs at the joint and to appreciate as well, it is a synovial, jo synovial joint. Now we get down to the forearm itself. Always recall that the radius is continuous virtually with the thumb. So once you're moving the thumb, in terms of identifying where it is, where is the radius, it always follows it. So if you could move your hand about, and in terms of locating the radius uh, bone, always just find your thumb and follow the thumb. <laughs> follow, just continue with the thumb, and you know that bone you're touching is the radius, regardless of how the hand moves. Okay, so that's a nice way to remember it. It's always continuous always continuous, right? The radius is always continuous with the thumb. And this is just the bones of the hand, take note. The, this is sometimes, particularly the bones, and this is often a question that is brought for your 
for your um, assessments, right? The hand, take note of them. You have the phalanges, metacarpals, carpals, or your wrist bones. Right? These are very important. So just take note of this diagram in particular. All right, so we looked at the pectoral girdle. The other girdle, of course, is your pelvic girdle. And coming back to the question that was asked previously, um, when you're looking at females in particular, you have a number of structures which are different. One, in terms of this pelvic uh, area, this opening, it is usually larger in females than it is in males. And then the iliac crest is wider set. So you have the flaring that occurs here associated with hips, which are found on women. So that is one way in terms of telling the difference as well. The coccyx as well, for males is more curved inwards, for females is more curved outwards or straight. And again, that has to do, you wouldn't want damage coming to the developing fetus. So important to note in terms of the coccyx, females it is straighter, whereas in males, you do have more of a curvature, which occurs. So this is uh, showing the pubic arch. It is wider, uh, wider set in females than in males. And again, that has to do with allowing more space for the developing uh, fetus to grow. Let me ask you this. So we mentioned in terms of the ribs. Yes, you have your two ribs. You have your floating and false ribs. Why don't we have the ribs coming all the way down to your pelvis? Why do they stop if you were to go back in terms of looking um, at your ribs? I pass it? Yes, I did. Right. Why do your ribs stop here? Why don't they come all the way down? So right. maybe that would make the body um, too stiff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be very rigid. So this allows movement to occur in terms of flexibility of the vertebral column. Yes. Any other reason has to do with females. So during pregnancy. Yeah, very good. I know <laughs> Frida, somebody else wanted to uh, say the same thing. So I applaud both of you. Yeah, so during pregnancy, you do have distension. Would it be a problem if you had ribs? Yeah, that would be a bit of a problem. You know, little Andrew, when little Andrew born, you know, he have the rib markings all across his forehead. Not a good thing, right? So to compensate for that, you do have that spacing, you know, that occurs here. I hear what some people saying, so, so, so then why it is then that males don't have, since males don't bear children, why males don't have all the ribs coming down? That's a good question. And who knows, maybe evolutionarily in a couple uh, hundred thousand or million years, you'll find that, um, you know, the species does have ribs, males have the ribs coming all the way down. But for now, you just have them up to this point. Yeah. But that's a good observation, as you mentioned, in terms of ribs as it relates to pregnancy. We're almost there. Let's talk about the limbs. We're looking now at the lower limb. So the lower limb comes from the hip joint. You have your thigh, leg, knee, knee joint, and of course, the foot and ankle joint. So this is what I was speaking about. When you're looking at the flaring, so for females, remember this bone, this is pelvic bone, it's more distended outward so therefore this femur is actually more for females is placed further out so therefore this angle coming down to the knee it's it's a little it's a little sharper and that is why it puts more strain actually on the acl not only the acl the anterior cruciate ligament and that is why females tend to have more in football they tend to have more acl injuries than me has to do with the the dynamics, structural dynamics of how they are physically built. Yeah, of course, the two bones, uh, your shin bone, your tibia, and your fibula. You're all familiar with this. For those, anybody when they used to be in school used to play kick for kick? No? I guess it was different times back then. We used to do rather strange things. We used to play this game called kick, you know, and kick and shin. You know, uh, until you, well, this you would back out first. You know, it was quite interesting. As the game that I mentioned we used to do, anybody used to jump down steps? When we were in school, we used to go on the steps. So start on the first step and you jump down, you go up two steps, 
you jump down, you go up three steps. You jump all the way down, you go up four steps. And you just keep going up the steps and jumping all the way down to the bottom of the stairs. I don't know. Anybody used to do that? No? In your time, that, yeah. game, was yeah, that, that game was played more in the boys. <laughs> And again, yeah, we didn't used to have um, cell phones and, and um, computers to distract us. So it was simpler times then. But we used to do that jumping down, you know. And of course, the more daring ones, sometimes up to the seventh step, you go and they jump all the way down. Oh, Lord. Really In says, my school, mm -hmm. we would get into serious trouble for that. For that, yeah. Or oh, similarly. So, you know, you used to do it, of course, you know, like during recess. And you have somebody on the lookout from the time I hear teach everybody scatter, you know. But he used to do some rain. Now that you look back at it, say God definitely protect, protects, you know, little children and the um the, the infirm of mind, those who have infirm, infirmities of the brain. Most definitely he looks after them. Yes. But we used to now looking back, I used to be like, what was I thinking? <laughs> but no injury came to us, fortunately. But that was a big thing. Who could jump from the you know the highest step? six, seven steps in there, jump, gee, all the way, oh, gosh. <laughs> now thinking about it, the number of things that could have gone wrong, you know, but fortunately it didn't, it had a good outcome. And then playing kick for kick, <laughs> that was probably more of a male thing, but you know, you're kicking one another on your shin, special. But that didn't used to go on too long because pain used to be introduced, which is another good thing as it relates to bone. Not only bone, but, you know, underlying the skin, when you look at the epidermis, right, you do have the dermal layer that has, you know, the, the, the uh, nerve endings, which alert you to pain, right? So that is very important there. Oh, That's you know, sir, mm -hmm. taking on it, we had something called, it wasn't kick for kick, but mm -hmm. it was like, it was a bokey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had that. Oh, gosh. Yes, and it, it had some people who saw some big fingers. Like, you used to keep away from yes, them. Yes, boy. <laughs> and they give you a bouquet. Oh, Lord, you feel like your hand crack, like your knuckles bust. Yes. I tell some people they're winding it up. They're bringing it back from fan. They're bringing it down and then releasing the finger. Oh, yes. Good old days, as they say. <laughs> Let's go back to the hip joint. So we're looking at the hip joint here. This is, shows the sectional and anterior view. And note well, ligaments. The ligaments are very important. Bone to bone connection, ligament. Muscle to bone connection is what? Tendons. Tendons, yeah, very good, right? So here you have the ligaments. Uh, sometimes in athletes, depending on their field of endeavor, you do have rupturing of these ligaments. And cases like that, surgical intervention, or sometimes, if it's not severe enough, sometimes rest could lead to the repair of the ligament itself. Always remember, the body machine could heal itself, but surgical intervention in some instances is necessary to accelerate that process. So the bones of the leg, the tibia and the fibula, fibula is the smaller of the two. This is your shin bone, the tibia, that's the major one. And these are the areas, the medial condyle, the lateral and the tibial tuberosity. These are the areas which allow um, interaction with different structures, in, part in particular here, the patella that allows movement to occur. There is down at the base of the tibia and you have the medial and lateral malleolus as shown here in the tibia, and then on the fibula, you have the lateral malleolus. This is your knee joint, we mentioned this, and this is the ACL, this is what we spoke talking about uh, earlier. This uh, ligament, this is the one in females, is ruptured more often in, in football based on studies that have been done, retrospective studies on injuries which have presented at hospitals. Uh, women outnumber the men in terms of ACL injuries, particularly in, in football, right? You also have, of course, the, not only the ACL, you have the PCL and the F, FCL, the fibular collateral ligament. These are the menisci, this is cartilage, which is between the bone, which of course prevents bone and bone rubbing. Now we reach down to the foot, right? This is the last of the slides. Do take note of your different uh, I was going to say, foot says, <laughs> your feet, right? So then you have the phalanges, the metatarsals, the cuneiform bones, and of course, the bigger ones here. The cuneiforms are part of the tarsals themselves. This one here, what is, what is the other name for calcaneus? 
calcaneus bone, also known as four letters, and your it heel. rhymes with your heel. Your heel. Good. Thanks, Trinell. Right. So that's your heel bone. And your, the calcaneus is attached to what structure? Calcaneus, your heel bone. What tendon is attached to? That comes from your gastrocnemius muscle or your calf muscle. What tendon comes down to the heel? A. Achilles. Yeah, Achilles, very good, Frida. It's the largest tendon in your body and you could feel for it. If you feel for it, sometimes you don't think, it doesn't feel like a tendon, right? But it is, it's very large, the largest tendon in your body, the Achilles tendon. So it goes from the cal calcaneus all the way up to your gastrocnemius, which is your calf muscle. And that allows um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion to occur. Right, so here it is showing here. So the, here you would have the tendon running, and let's say up here is your calf muscle, and you'd have the extension going up here. We all know the story of Achilles, yes? So Achilles, back to Greek mythology again, he did some good things, so they, the gods made him invincible. And to make him invincible, what did they have to do? They had to dip him, dip him in the river Styx. And to dip him in the river Styx, they held him right, right at this point. Right, which is, and they dipped him into the river. And then when they took him out, the river sticks, he was, you know, invincible, immortal in all areas, except here, because that's where they were holding him to dip him in. And hence the reason that was his weak point, the Achilles tendon. Um, so of course, if you get here cut, you, you lose dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, you will not be able to walk. And this was Achilles' one weak point. So yes, he could get, I don't know, hit everywhere else, Nothing would happen, but this was his weak point, the Achilles tendon, right? And that's where we want to stop for today. So we looked at the skeleton today and its divisions. Uh, we looked at the cells, uh, the osteoblasts and osteoclasts that contribute the calcium homeostasis in the body itself. Calcium, very important as it relates to the proper activity of muscles in the body itself. So therefore we saw the intervention of parathyroid hormone coming from the uh, thyroid gland, uh, very important in terms of maintenance of that calcium levels within the body itself. Notwithstanding the calcium levels, we also looked at the different bones comprising the axial and appendicular skeletons, right? So we looked at those divisions, the axial skull, the skull, vertebra and ribs and the appendicular consisting of your two uh, girdles, your pectoral and pelvic girdles, together with the attached limbs, the arms and legs. In terms of the bones, we looked at the different bones associated with the skull itself. Top, of course, being your parietal, frontal, temporal, and to the back of your occipital bone. Those are very important bones to take note of. And the vertebral column, we looked at the vertebral column in terms of the vision, 712554, as it relates to the cervical thoracic lumbar uh, procedural uh, vertebra. So the, the last two sets of vertebra, they are fused together in terms of the 5-4 five, the arrangement. So the cervical thoracic and lumbar vertebra, 7-12-5. Cervical, of course, the topmost one being the atlas vertebra, and immediately below it, C2, being the axis vertebra, which allows pivoting of the head itself. Then we looked at a little more detail in terms of the bones, moved away from the vertebra. We looked at the bones of the axial and appendicular skeleton, and went down in, in turn, and we mentioned the importance of them as it relates to anatomical land posts, Right, so it, it enables when you're looking at an X-ray to identify certain structures within the body itself, and that is very important, it's particularly to a surgeon, or to identify any type of disease or disease structures which occurs in the body by looking at those particular landmarks relating to the skeleton itself.